I believe that if we are honest with ourselves, that the most fascinating problem in the world is who am I? What do you mean? What do you feel when you say the word I? I myself. I don't think there can be any more fascinating preoccupation than that because it's so mysterious, it's so elusive. Because what you are in your inmost being escapes your examination in rather the same way that you can't look directly into your own eyes without using a mirror, you can't bite your own teeth, you can't taste your own tongue, and you can't touch the tip of this finger with the tip of this finger. And that's why there's always an element of profound mystery in the problem of who we are. This problem has fascinated me for many years and I've made many inquiries. What do you mean by the word I? And there is a certain consensus about this, a certain agreement especially among people who live in Western civilization. Most of us feel I, ego, myself, my source of consciousness, to be a center of awareness and of a source of action that resides in the middle of a bag of skin. And so, we have what I have called the conception of ourselves as a skin encapsulated ego. Now it's very funny how we use the word I. If we just refer to common speech, we are not accustomed to say, I am a body. We rather say, I have a body. We don't say, I beat my heart, in the same way as we say, I walk, I think, I talk. We feel that our heart beats itself, and that has nothing very much to do with I. In other words, we don't regard I myself as identical with our whole physical organism. We regard it as something inside it. And most Western people locate their ego inside their heads. You are somewhere between your eyes and between your ears and the rest of you dangles from that point of reference. It is not so in other cultures when a Chinese or Japanese person wants to locate the center of himself, he points here, not here, here to what Japanese call the kokoro, or the Chinese call shin, the heart, mind. Some people also locate themselves in the solar plexus. But by and large, we locate ourselves between, behind the eyes and somewhere between the ears as if within the dome of the skull there was some sort of arrangement such as there is at the SAC headquarters in Denver where there are men in great rooms surrounded with radar screens and all sorts of things and earphones on watching all the movements of planes all over the world so in the same way we have really the idea of ourselves as a little man inside our heads who has earphones on which bring messages from the ears and who has a television set in front of him which brings messages from the eyes and all sorts of uh, electrode things are all over his body giving him signals from the hands and so on and he has a panel in front of him with buttons and dials and things 
And so he more or less controls the body, but he isn't the same as the body because I am in charge of what are called the voluntary actions. And what are called involuntary actions of the body, they happen to me. I am pushed around by them, but to some extent also I can push my body around. This, I have concluded, is the ordinary, average conception of what is oneself. And look at the way children, influenced by our cultural environment, ask questions. Mommy, who would I have been if my father had been someone else? You see, the child gets the idea from our culture that the father and mother gave him a body into which he was popped at some moment, whether it was conception or whether it was parturition is a little bit vague. But there is in our whole way of thinking the idea that we are a soul, a spiritual essence of some kind, imprisoned inside a body. And that we look out upon a world that is foreign to us. In the words of the poet Hausman, I, a stranger and afraid, in a world I never made. And so, therefore, we speak of confronting reality, facing the facts. We speak of coming into this world. And this whole sensation that we are brought up to have of being an island of consciousness locked up in a bag of skin, facing outside us a world that is profoundly alien to us in the sense that what is outside me is not me. This sets up a fundamental sensation of hostility and estrangement between ourselves and the so-called external world. And therefore, we go on to talk about the conquest of nature, the conquest of space, and view ourselves in a kind of battle array towards the world outside us. I shall have much more to say about that in the second lecture. But in the first now, I want to examine the strange feeling of being an isolated self. Now actually, it is absolutely absurd to say that we came into this world. We didn't. We came out of it. What do you think you are? Supposing this world is a tree. Are you leaves on its branches? Or are you a bunch of birds that settled on a dead old tree from somewhere else? Surely, everything that we know about living organisms from the standpoint of the sciences shows us that we grow out of this world. That we, each one of us, are what you might call symptoms of the state of the universe as a whole. But you see, that is not part of our common sense. Western man has for many centuries been under the influence of two great myths. When I use the word myth, I don't necessarily mean falsehood. To me, the word myth signifies a great idea in terms of which man tries to make sense of the world. It may be an idea, it may be an image. Now the two images which have most profoundly influenced Western man are number one, the image of the world as an artifact. Like a carpenter's table 
or a jar made by a potter.